So we get to where we can use it. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next panel discussion. And I'm Glenn Loop, the executive director at Cigar Rights of America, which fights smoking bans, taxes, and federal regulations. So the biggest challenge of the next half hour is me going through the next litany without talking about politics. Uh, which will, we might integrate a little bit into, into the end of this, but we've got a distinguished panel of, of noted retailers uh, up here to talk about creative approaches and vendor relationships and how that uh, leverages business success. We have Jeff Borschwitz from Corona Cigar Company, Rick Baker from Tobacco Grove in Minnesota, Michael Fry with Monte Cristo, Tobacco Box, and Casa Fuente. Is there anything else you own that you'd like to talk about? <laughs> So with that, uh, to, to get st started on the subject of leveraging vendor relationships. With the premium cigar industry, it's obvious that it's a very personable business. It thrives, its ebbs, its flows, its success, its failures seem to be consistently tied to personal relationships, whether it's between the retailer and the manufacturer, the retailer and the wholesaler, and ultimately to the consumer. And, and these three folks bring a unique perspective to each of that. Well, so we'll just kick it off with a, with a flow of questions and have each of you chime in respectively on that, uh, beginning with this one. How would you describe your relationship with the numerous sales representatives with which you do business? The premium cigar industry, the reps are as much of a part of this industry as, as anybody. And, and the last decade of my flowing in and out of cigar shops from Los Angeles to Boston there seems to be always a cigar rep in a cigar shop. So let's chat a little bit about the relationship you've got with those reps, and frankly, are they a bother or are they an asset? So Jeff, let's kick that thing off. They are definitely not a bother, and they're an asset that needs to be managed and coached. Um, I've been in the business for 22 years, and in reality, the sales force for the premium cigar industry, when you compare it to other industries, was not very good. Um, if you look at like what sales forces do in the premium spirits industry, or the beer industry, or the grocery industry, or the automotive segment, you know these are much larger industries that have much more sophisticated sales forces. Um, what I found is that we had a lot of order takers. Mm -hmm. Guys just walk in with an, a, a pad, an order pad, expect you to give them an order, and they felt their job was done. Now, I don't want to say I'm a hard guy on them, but I, I don't accept that. In that, when you, because you got to remember, sales guys get paid off of your order. Mm -hmm. So, I don't believe that you have a sales guy that comes into your store. Just remember, whatever you write for him, just figure 10% at least of that's just going straight to him. So for a guy to sit in front of you and spend 15 to 30 minutes and take several thousand dollar order from you and not do much for it, and you look at how much work you had to do to sell those whatever, three, four, five thousand dollars worth of cigars, you had to do a lot of work. And I feel that you know, everything has to be in balance. So your sales guys are part of, they're part of your business. And so they need to earn that money, in my opinion. So I, I and I don't, I, I, I make it very straightforward. So if I'm writing you a big order, you need to earn it. So how should they earn your money? When they come into your store, they at least need to go look at how their product's looking. Take a look at the inventory. Is our inventory correct? Are the boxes that are, that are on the shelf, are you making sure that everything is, is singled? Now that's our job as retailers, but nobody's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. And we've got four stores and a lot of employees and a ton of cigars. So every now and then you can find that there might be a box of, let's say a, a Robusto size, that's sitting as back stock, but it's not on the shelf, right? So sometimes those things can get missed. So the sales guy, it should be his job to come look. When you go to Publix or something and you look, you know, when they're restocking or you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you see those guys, the vendors, they're checking their product. 
making sure the stuff's on the shelf, making sure things look right. If you got boxes of cigars where they're all faded in different colors, wrappers, because it's not selling good enough, they need to take them back. So I look at these relationships with the sales guys. They're critical. The guys need to come in and work. Their job's not to come and sit around and hang out and talk to the customers and give out free cigars. Educate our staff. Yep. Spend time looking at your product. You know, so there's, you know, that, that's just my take on it. And there's, you know, we can get deeper than that, but that's, that's a, a good starting point. Rick, uh, Minnesota's not an easy place to get to. Uh, <laughs> and so I imagine the reps, though, they have to make the pilgrimage to Minnesota. How do, you, uh, how do you deal with those relationships? Yeah, they've got to get their, their snowboards and their skis just to make it in. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, a lot of what, what Jeff said, and, and he's absolutely right, it's, you know, I've, we've always said reps sell cigars, but good reps are consultants with you, hmm. and they're the ones that are helping you grow that brand. You know, sometimes um, you'll get in a rep and, like he said, they're just here to just take, take your order and they just want to get out. Well, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm not interested in someone just to, I can call somebody to do that. What I am interested in is someone that can come in, keep me up to speed as to what's going on within the company, what's, you know, potential production issues, if any, that are happening, uh, what we should be looking for down the road, potential new releases, et cetera. Educate us on the, on the product. Let, let us know what they're seeing, what trends they're seeing in other stores. Um, and, and then really, like I said, it's, it's, it's all about educating the staff. And I, I personally do enjoy when they spend time with our customers. I, I like that, actually, because what I've found is that, at least in our store, we have a group of guys and a, a great core group of customers that when they start to build that personal relationship with some of those vendors, we find that their product starts moving really, really well. And it's not about giving out free cigars but just that personal time to remember that customer's name and, and that personal time to, to catch up and spend a couple minutes, all of a sudden, what, what brand do you represent? Oh, you're with Altidus. Oh, what, what is that? Oh, you do Monte Cristo. You do Romeo and Juliet. Oh, yeah, I like that cigar. And then, oh, well, let me show you this cigar, et cetera. And it goes from there. So really looking for them to be a consultant. I think the quote of the day is good reps are consultants. That's a unique yeah. perspective on all this. Michael, uh, we'll talk about your branded lounges a little bit later, but you've got the, you've got the cigar box. So how do you deal with reps uh, going in and out of that part of your empire? Well, we're very fortunate because we have great reps. And uh, I think what Jeff said up front was the most important. In the beginning, uh, you have to manage your reps. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing, uh, in addition uh, to what these gentlemen said, is that you have to make sure that your reps understand your business. Because back in the day, uh, at post boom, uh, when they actually had to sell, uh, you know, they would say, well, you need to carry this, 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 and this. And then you just got to put on the brake and say, hold on a second. Mm -hmm. For my business, I need to do this, this, and this. And I think once you come to an understanding with uh, your uh, individual rep, of, of what your expectation is, and they understand that, then it's great. And I, I, we have wonderful relationships mm -hmm. with our reps because they understand our business, and we just get on to building that business together. Yep. Rick raised an angle that was actually going to lead into my next question, that is, and that is the relationship or the interaction between the rep and the consumer. Jeff and, and Michael, since y'all want to tail into that part of it, do you encourage that relationship or the interaction or the communication between the rep and the, con and the consumer? Do you mind that or do you see that as your job? Well, the way I see it is that when you're doing a, an event, let's say a sales event, they should be engaging with every customer that comes through the door. That's the whole reason of doing that event. So, you know, in times like that, they need to be focused on the consumer. But the point that I think I was trying to drive about um, let me give you scenarios of what we used to see. We have bars, lounges, and what I don't need is a rep coming in, taking the order, keeping his 10%, and going spending the rest of the day drinking beer, smoking cigars, like a customer. Mm -hmm. That's not what they're there for. And that's what I'm saying. But when we're doing an event, that's when you need to be hustling. 
selling the cigars, talking about what makes your stuff, you know, your product great, and what the deals are. So there's a time to engage, but what I find, what has historically been, is that reps, that wasn't the case. It was, you know, write the order down, and go hang out and smoke cigars all day. So we, we've, now remember, I kept saying, this has been 22 years. We don't have that issue anymore, but I'm just saying, I'm trying to share some advice of changes that, that, that I had to make early on in our, you know, in, in, in Corona Cigar, because I saw what was happening in the industry. So when a new rep comes in, the first thing I would recommend you do, have a great relationship with that rep, mm -hmm. but be very clear what it is you expect out of them. Don't harbor, if you got, if you got concerns with your rep, don't, don't hold it back. Listen, we can all be friends and still talk business and be very clear what it is their role needs to be when they come into your shop. Michael, do you encourage the reps to interact with your customers at Cigar Box? We like it. Uh, again, most of our reps are very passionate about their brands and they're not just trying to meet numbers. So I like when they share that passion with our customer and that they help uh, educate our our, our customer, and I think it's very helpful for them because they become educated from our customer as well. So it's it's a good give and take. Um, I don't mind so much after uh, after the, we do the business that they hang out. I mean, we're not a huge market like New York where you have 30 stores and they're on a very tight schedule. There's not that many stores in Las Vegas, so you know they come in. We do the business. They sit down uh, with our staff or with our customer, have a cigar and a coffee, and I think that's great. And I, I, they're great for promoting our business. So, Michael, one of the things I want to bring up, though, like for example, we have three stores in Orlando. So, what would happen is the reps would want to show up to the store where they get the order, right? But not go to the other two, right? Mm, right. Because you got your money. Yeah. Right. So that's the other thing you have to make clear. You need to go to those other stores and spend time with the staff and do everything that we had already talked about. Checking to make sure the products are on the shelf, and make sure that, you know, and the other thing is that a rep should never walk into a store ever without bringing in cigars for the staff. I mean, that's a currency. Which is still legal under the FDA. Right. right. But business to business. You wouldn't believe how many times I'd see guys come in in, in come in empty handed. Yes. And I'm like, dude, I don't need the cigars. Share it with the guys that are yes. selling it. You know what I mean? This is nuts. Now let me tell you what used to happen. You know, back in the, again, I've been in this for a while, these guys would take their car stock and samples and they'd sell that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it was for. The manufacturers yes. sent it to the sales rep to share it with your staff. So that's why I'm saying, you, you know, you've gotta watch what's going on here to make sure, so if they're not walking in your stores with cigars for your staff, I'd be calling up the food chain at the company that, that he works for because something's probably going on. And Jeff, you, you brought up a good point about sharing the samples with the staff. A lot of times we'll see, um, I shouldn't say a lot of times, but it happens, where a rep will come in and all they want to do is focus on the owner of the business. You know, they want to sit down with the owner, that's all their time is taken up, and, and then here, oh, he, by the way, here's a couple cigars for you and that kind of thing, and then the guys that are working, the guys that are managing the humidor, that are spending the time with the customers, they're getting very little time with them, if any, and almost no cigars sometimes from That's them. Right. And, and I've, I've, I've hammered on a couple reps in the past where I've said, listen, you don't need to come and talk to me. I want you to spend more time with my staff, giving them that information, and then also giving them the samples. They're, they are the ones that are your first point of contact with your brand to the customers. That should be a big part of your focus. Subject I've always kind of been academically curious about since we're starting to run around in, in this industry is the difference between an in-house sales staff for the manufacturers versus brokers. I just saw my friend Joel Schwartz outside representing uh, Illusion here at the trade show, but Joel represents Perdomo and Tatuaje and multiple other cigar brands, so I'm always curious about this. So I'm gonna phrase this question this way. When it comes to dealing with in-house sales staff for manufacturers versus a broker for multiple brands, which do you think works better for the manufacturer or your business? How do you prioritize 
or how do they prioritize what they're going to push to you when they represent multiple brands? And do you think it's better for these manufacturers to have in-house sales staff? So, Rick, why don't we start with you on that? I'm a, I think it's fine for either one. Um, I, I don't have a, I've never come across personally an issue where um, one is necessarily better than the other, ex, you know, et cetera. Um, yes, there are brokers that we have that, you know, in their portfolio, we may only be taking one or two lines of the five or six that they have. Um, and that's common. Um, and when we talk with them, it's, it's, listen, let's focus on where the bread and butter is right now. And if we decide to explore, et cetera, we'll get to that. But as far as both of them, um, in-house sales is great uh, as well. So it, again, it's, it's, it's almost uh, person by person specific. How does the broker decide what they're gonna push? I mean, do they go by the strength of the brand or do they say, I'm representing this new guy who produces 500,000 cigars a year and I'd like you to try it on your shelf. I mean, the, the competition for shelf space is ferocious anymore. Yeah. Michael, how do you handle it? So do you like dealing with brokers or in-house staff? The same as Rick. It really doesn't matter to us. Um, as, and I hearken back to what I said in the beginning. Um, when they understand our business, the brokers understand what we want to carry and what we like and what we want to do. So it, there's no issue, well, I need you to take this. I mean, we try everything, but... Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter because once they understand what we want to do, they pretty much stick to our program. Yeah. Jeff? The only difference between the, the brokers and the having in-house sales is the size of the brand. So if a company has a large enough uh, volume of sales to support the in-house, they're going to go with your in-house. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as, as which ones are better to deal with, um, We've got good brokers. We've got good sales guys. So it doesn't uh, doesn't make that much of a of a difference on that. Really, the question is more on the supply side. Is their brand big enough yet to have an in-house sales force? I'm curious. Do any of you use consumers or perhaps consumer surveys in making purchasing decisions on what you're going to put on the shelf? Do any of you engage with that either formally or informally? Jeff, let's start with you. You got. Uh, multiple stores in Orlando, you got a local market as well as a tourist market? Yeah, so we don't use any consumer surveys on that. Um, I'm in the business because I love the cigar business. I'm a consumer and uh, Glenn knows I'm looking at stuff all the time on whether it's social media or, or whatever else. So uh, I, I really have my finger on the pulse of what's going on. Uh, so if you, you know, when you see a brand getting traction, we gotta make sure we have it, mm -hmm. but at the same time, um, you know, you gotta be careful. The one thing I caution some of you guys about is, you know, there, there, there's some unscrupulous suppliers out there that'll literally put plants in your store and ask for a brand that they asked him to ask you for, yep. and yet nobody's gonna buy it. So make sure you use your own judgment on that one because, you know, they'll say, oh yeah, we had customers asking, looking for our cigar in your store. And, you know, just don't always believe that. Um, you know, you talk to your customers, and and you should you should always have a, you know, communications a two-way street. So the feedback from your customers, if there's something they're looking for, how did they learn about it? They probably learned about it on social media, or cigar aficionado, or something else. So, you know, if you're involved, if you're watching all that stuff, you usually know what's what's getting traction and what what isn't. Rick, Michael, chime in on using the consumer to decide what's on the shelf. You know, a lot of times. You're always looking for feedback from customers. Um, you know, certainly, at least in our shop, you can't carry everything, and then there's a lot that we don't carry. Um, so you're not going to always be able to hit every single need for a customer. Um, but that said, you're keeping tabs on things. So if a customer comes in and they happen to mention XYZ company, and you know, you don't carry that, you, you just kind of make a mental note of that. Oh, so and so is looking at. Well, and then you ask, well, how did you how you hear about them? Oh, I had one when I was at such and such store. I had one when I was down in Corona, and it was great. And it, oh, okay, you know, good. And then the more and more you start to hear about it, and it's kind of like making those mental notes where then you kind of spend a little bit of time looking into, well, how are they doing? And then, you know, we ask our colleagues, you know, hey, how, how's, how's that brand doing for you, et cetera. But like Jeff said, we don't have a formal survey uh, for customers, but we are constantly listening, constantly listening. 
Michael, you'd get the consumers to chime in in cigar box? <laughs> we have consumers that come in and ask about new cigars and things like that. And, uh, you know, usually uh, Jason and the rest of the staff will, will work to bring those in for us to try. And we see how we like it, whatever. And I think it's important. I have four or five friends in the industry that I talk to on a regular basis. And I'll ask them, uh, you know, what's going on, you know, with that brand in their stores, or they'll ask me, hey, what's working out there? Anything new? So I, I you know, I just sort of work the grapevine and, and find out, you know, if, if we're missing something. When we say vendor relationships, we can also mean relationships with brands. Two of our panelists have unique <coughs> links to some of the well-known brands of the entire cigar industry. Jeff is very close with the Diamond Crown and the Diamond Crown lounges, and, and Michael with Monte Cristo and Casa Fuente. Other major manufacturers such as Rocky Patel, Davidoff, among others, promote branded establishments and lounges. How does this benefit your sales and marketing, and would you encourage those in the retail community to link themselves to national brands or labels of, of that nature? Michael? With Casa Fuente, I guess it's pretty easy. You walk into the humidor and you go, do you want a Fuente or do you want a Fuente? Uh, but uh, you want to chat a little bit about your relationship with, with major branded lounges of that nature. Monte Cristo, obviously, is a, is a force of nature and is, is a brand, and, and not, as well as Fuente. How do you use that to, to increase the business? And, and then we'll talk to Rick a little bit about that at the local level. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different for us because we're in Las Vegas, and Monte Cristo and you know Casa Fuente, everything in there is made by Casa, by the Fuente family. So there's not a whole lot of decision making there, and all the cigars we carry there are great. Uh, you know Monte Cristo, uh, we're in the middle of Caesar's Palace, so uh, the brand's very important from a brand recognition standpoint. And it stands for you know quality, uh, history, uh, so it, it it makes it easy, and I, I'm very proud to be part, you know, of that brand. And you know they make great cigars, and and they have never you know restricted you know what I could carry in there. Besides, you know they want a certain amount of their stuff in there, but um, it, it's wonder for me. It's wonderful, uh, and I have a captive audience, so. You know, Jeff's situation's different because, uh, uh, you know, he, he's not in the middle of a hotel. And, and But I would imagine, Jeff, that yeah. it, it means a lot to have that name behind you. So, Jeff, how do you use the Diamond Crown to your advantage? Well, we have, we have four branded, we have four brick-and-mortar retail stores, and every one of them has a branded lounge. We have a Diamond Crown lounge in one of our stores. We have a uh, Monte Cristo cigar bar in one of them. The other one is a Drew Estate lounge. He owns a Davidoff uh, licensed store. So what I like about the, it, it's, it's like a collaboration. And the collaboration that we have are with worldwide recognized luxury brands or brands that are very, uh, you know, Drew Estate has a big following and they're very creative and cutting edge, right? So when you have Diamond Crown, Davidoff, uh, Monte Cristo and, and Drew Estate, they all bring something different to the table, and um, I'm very happy with it. And it adds, it adds something extra to our establishments, and there's always little, I don't want to use the word perks, because there's, let's call it little uh, things that are part of the agreement, um, whether it's an exclusive cigar or additional uh, marketing support. Um, but it's, you know, when, if, if you're ever approached on that type of thing, just make sure that there's, it's a two-way street. Because mm -hmm. remember, you're offering an exclusive marketing of your, you know, your store. For example, you know, you've got Casa Fuente, and it's, it's known as, it's, you know, Michael and I were just talking. You go to the, the, the Monte Cristo Cigar Bar, it's not Michael Fry's or, or Cigar Box. You've made a decision to put Monte Cristo's name ahead of yours or adding it to yours. So you have to make sure that the guys that are doing that, you know, that's not a free thing. So that there's something that comes with it to, to justify doing it. But for us, it's, um, it's, it, it's a very good thing for us. Rick, do you see the value in a local retailer 
I mean, Rocky Patel does it all over the country with individual single brick and mortar retail shops. Uh, Nick Perdomo is taking over the state of Alabama by doing that. Uh, some of the mid-tier manufacturers that are, I say mid-tier, but I, they wouldn't want to hear that, but that are not Fuente and not of Monte Cristo are also doing these branded lounges with individual brick and mortars throughout the country. Yeah. Do you see value in that, or, and have you thought about that? Sure, and again, it's like what Jeff had said, is there's got to be, it's two-way street. You know, there's got to be some type of, uh, of value to you as well. Uh, for example, at Tobacco Grove, um, we have uh, multiple lounges within our store, and one of them is, uh, we, we, we spent time creating a Rocky Patel lounge. And that lounge specifically, what we did is we modeled it after, just like after burn, you know, down, down in Florida. And so we, we made this experience where you walk in to this one room and it's the Rocky Patel experience. It's, it's that feeling, you know, you've got the, 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 shan the Moroccan chandeliers and the, the candles and it's, it's really elegant, it's nice. Uh, so having those individual ways of branding, you know, um, I think it's a really good thing, you know, with the right vendors, it's a good thing. I know uh, Havana Phil, who won the Tobacconist of the Year, God rest his soul, uh, in his shop in Greensboro has a branded Davidoff Lounge and a Rocky Patel Lounge, and they complement each other. He plays off of that. Yeah. One's private, one's open to the public, but I think the manufacturers are also getting more sophisticated in using those, those established brands to promote their, their cigars. Yeah. More of a question for Rick, and, and this is really, because my guess is, given the size of your, your establishment versus, say, a, a Jeff's, you have to be much more selective in how you decide what goes on the shelf. And with the yeah. growth of the boutique side of the, of the market, really what helps you drive a decision on what gets on that shelf and what doesn't? I've seen pictures of your humidor. You've obviously got a vast selection, but my guess is you have to be very, very careful as to what you afford shelf space. How do you come to those conclusions? Yeah, um, you know, Tobacco Grove, our, our, we just have one store is, is what we have. Um, <clears throat> basically with that, it, it's, we look at the humidor as, as an apartment complex and every single box of cigars is a tenant that's paying rent, okay? And if that box of cigars, if it's not paying its rent, it's gotta go and you gotta get something else in there that's going to pay for its rent, okay? And you're gonna find that trends change, things are big one, one year that are not big the next year, et cetera. Um, you really, it, f for us, it comes down to the customer. It's all about the customer. So knowing your customer base, knowing what they like. Uh, it, for example, you may have a store where large ring gauge cigars are huge, and, and you sell a ton of large ring gauge cigars, okay? That's gonna be a heavy focus for you. For our store, it's not. Uh, we, we sell very few large ring gauge cigars. In fact, we've actually cultivated a nice group of individuals that, that even like Corona-sized cigars, you know? Um, and again, that comes down to educating the customer, et cetera, with that as well. So uh, it's really, again, all about the customer. It's what they're looking for. It's making good, educated decisions with your rep, with your vendor, um, as to, you know, what product's gonna work for your store, looking at analytics, looking at data, et cetera, and again, just keeping your ear to, to the railroad tracks as to what's the buzz, what's going on out there that's big that you should be looking at right now. Michael, Jeff, how tough is it for an ultra boutique or a new craft uh, manufacturer to get on your shelves? Michael, start with you. I mean, once the rep comes in and sits down with uh, our staff and, and, and myself and, and we try the cigars, if we like it and there's passion behind that brand, we're going to give them a chance uh, because it's always great to get in with somebody new and sort of support the underdog a little bit. And then again, it's, uh, as these gentlemen have eloquently said, it's engaging the customer to try that brand and the customer is going to determine if that brand's staying. I like the analogy about the apartment building. If, yeah. if, you know, you're not evicting them. They're, <laughs> they're staying there. So, I, you know, we give them the chance if we like it, and then the customers tell us whether they stay or go. Yep. Jeff, you got tens of thousands of facings. How difficult yeah. is it to get on the shelf? So boutiques is a, is a tough one. The, what happens is in our stores, we have a lot of shelf space. So th there's, there's two sides to this. I love 
the fact that the premium cigar industry historically has been something where we've been able to watch people start with nothing and, and turn into something big. And <coughs> that's what makes this industry so attractive for so many people. You know, we're not the, the cigarette industry where you got Philip Morris controlling whatever, 60, 70, 80 percent of the market. You've got little guys that can really, you know, I remember watching Pepin Garcia when he started his little factory in Miami after he split with Eduardo Fernandez. And that's just a good example of how somebody can start from nothing and look at how big the My Father brands are. So with that is I love the spirit of the industry with boutiques. Now, mm -hmm. as a business guy, boutiques are dangerous. Mm -hmm. And let me explain why. When I walk into other cigar stores and I look at their shelves and see what's in there, inevitably I'll see some no-name brands that are covered in dust. And at the end of the, guy, end of the day, this guy that owns the store, that's his money that's tied up. And then all you guys know that your inventory is your cash. And if that stuff's sitting there and it's collecting dust, you're gonna have a hard time paying your rent and paying employees and other things because you know, your, your landlord doesn't accept boutique cigars as payment. He only takes a check, right? So you gotta be careful about that. And so one of the things that happens is that the, the boutique guys always wanna go for the big fish. They wanna get it into like Corona Cigar. And I understand why, because you can use that as a sales tool. Hey, Corona's carrying it, you should too, right? But here's what happens. If the boutique brand comes into our store when the market's not ready for it, it's gonna die on a shelf and we're gonna close it out in grab bags, which is how we get rid of our cigars that don't move. And if you have cigars that don't move, I, I highly recommend you do the same thing because that inventory will kill your business. So when these boutiques come out, I will talk to the guy, I'll encourage the guy, I'll give him advice, but I may not give him an order. And I'll tell him, listen, it's just not time yet to put it in Corona Cigar. And let me explain why. When you walk in the store and you see an aisle, when I tell you an aisle, it's a row of 150 facings of Padrones and every other brand that we have. Why is the guy gonna pick up your cigar over the other established brands? And the only reason someone will pick it up is that it's got enough traction. Either it's got a high enough rating or it's got enough buzz on social media to get someone to buy that. Now it happens. I'll, I mean, I'll use an example. Warped Cigars is a brand of boutique that's made it for us. I mean, it's, it sells. But I remember when the brand came out, you know, it, it, you know you've got certain, for every warp, one warped cigar, there's 10 that didn't make it. So w all I'm saying is that when that brand, when that boutique goes out of business, you don't want to be like musical chairs, where the last place those cigars are stuck in your humidor and it's your money. <laughs> so just be careful with it. And uh, you know, at the same time, we we try to, if if we think the brand can make it, we're we're the first ones to give a guy a shot. But also, don't don't fall prey of of giving a, an order out of guilt, <laughs> or being the nice guy. You've got to remember this is a business. And so make your decisions based on those sound business principles. One of the things I have enjoyed and thought was unique about the TPE show was basically that unique section of just the boutiques together mm -hmm. at the entrance to the show. So I thought that was a, a unique marketing angle for this specific show. Um, events. Events in the premium cigar business seem to have become a staple of every shop's marketing strategy. Do you encourage the vendors that you deal with to have events in your stores, or are they too a nuisance? Uh, I know a lot of retailers have different attitudes about towards events, and they're all cussing Rocky Patel for forcing everybody to have an event so that he can show up. <laughs> but uh, it forces other manufacturers, obviously, to up their game, to get out into the field, to touch the customer, Nick Perdomo does it, you know, Carlito gets out, Rocky is noted for it, but uh, individual reps have also taken on a life of their own. Do you encourage events in your, in your respective stores? So Jeff, we'll start with you. I know you keep a busy calendar of them. We do a lot of events. However, I'll give you a little advice on what to do, in my opinion, on events. If you're getting, if you're, if you have a, we like to sell expensive cigars, okay? You, the opportunity for people to smoke cigars is not nearly what it used to be. So when someone smokes a cigar, let's make it the best cigar they can afford. 
So we have a base of customers that understand that. They're not looking for the cheapest cigar. They're, if he can smoke one cigar a week, let's make it a great one, right? So when we do events, we probably, for every event we do, we probably turn down 10. And that's because we want to stay focused on the brands that help your business. So if somebody's wanting to do an event at your store, and most of your guys, let's say you're buying eight to $10 cigars, and this event focuses on a brand that sells for $4, you can't do it. Don't do it. It's going to hurt your company. It's going to help the brand, and it's going to help that manufacturer, but it's going to hurt your store. Because you don't want to condition your customers that we're smoking $8 cigars to start switching up to a $4 brand. It's not good for business. So that's the only thing is that, but, but at the same time, the brands that build your business, the brands that you do well with, that you make money on, that you don't have to worry about you know, getting a Cigars International catalog, selling it for half the price that you're selling it for. Focus on those brands that help your business and do events with those brands. Rick, do you use events to get people out of the cold in Minnesota? <laughs> get some indoors, get some warm, right? Um, yeah, events, uh, we do a lot of events. We try to do um, some bigger events as well. Um, events are really taxing and they can be taxing on your staff. Um, especially if you're piling them on and piling them on. And they also become taxing on your customer base, too, if you're not spacing them out properly and doing them right. Um, one thing to, to consider, too, when you're, when you're looking at doing events, and there are, you know, we've done events, you know, Davidoff dinners and you know, Rocky and Nish are in town, et cetera. You know, you'd, we've done all of those. But there are events that sometimes we choose not to do because... We know our customers very well, and I've had experience in the past where certain brands, when it's either the rep or sometimes it's the brand owner comes in, and they can actually have an adverse effect. <laughs> they can have a negative effect. Uh, and I've seen it happen actually quite a few times, where you've got a line that's out there and it's doing pretty darn well, and you're like, great, you know what, we're gonna have an event, boom, we're gonna hit it big, and then the brand owner comes up, and he kind of sits in the corner and does nothing. He pisses off a couple customers. You know, he's not friendly, et cetera. And then the guy that's been smoking his cigar sitting there going, why am I buying this guy's cigar? You know, th there's all these other ones that are great. So I've seen it do the, the exact adverse uh, action as well. So you really do need to be careful. Know your reps. Know how they are. And again, like we talked earlier, that's why I encourage our reps to engage our customers um, on a, in a friendly aspect as well, because I've seen the positive way that it's an affected uh, a sale for, for our events, et cetera. Um, and, and then again, I take note. If that rep comes in and, like you guys have said, they come in and they kind of, hey, okay, I take my order and I'm going to go sit and have a beer and a cigar and then they're out of here, well, that's probably how they're going to be with the event too. And that's not going to make you any money. Michael, I know you're primarily a lot of tourist-driven uh, traffic for your respective establishments, but do, like cigar box and the like, do you use events to get people, especially since it's a rather new establishment? Uh, we do very few, if any, events anymore. Um, I, I've been in the business as long as Jeff, and I, I don't understand Las Vegas as a marketplace in, in terms of events. Um, we find now... Uh, that it's just not beneficial for us to do events because uh, a there's so much going on in las vegas all the time yep. and vegas is very spread out now so it's not it's not easy to do uh but what we've started to do is we like to call it like a meet and greet where especially with the younger cigar makers like enrique sejas came in and some of the younger guys who are coming up we just have them come into the store and we let the customers know and then they come in and they just interact in a very casual uh, way without huge pressure and specials and deals and you know people looking for free stuff pre -F FDA um, so it and it seems to work and and if the cigars are good and the guys are interesting the cigars sell so it's a much more casual approach uh, to the traditional cigar story then. And anytime Carlito shows up, it's an instant event anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Right. 
<laughs> so with that, we've only got a, a couple of minutes uh, left for this discussion. So let's, uh, before I do a closeout question and the like, let's see if there's any questions from the audience. Yes, sir. In, in terms of uh, the mid-sized vendors that can't necessarily compete with the, the building you a lounge or the discounts uh, up to the same degree, how can they provide value to you and still you know, compete so that you say, well, we can have this brand in our store and we believe in it, even though they can't put in a lounge for us? Or what are the things they can do? Jeff, you want to take that? Did you hear? So Knowing the, the question in, in, the, in the company, that, uh, Terrence with, with Agonorsa, and Agonorsa is a, a, a great company that's one of the smaller companies on the retail side of cigars, but Agonorsa is a giant when it comes to the tobacco growing in Nicaragua, and they are first class. And so one of the cool things that I've watched transition with a company like Agonorsa in uh, the brands, the Casa Fernandez brands, is that, that you guys are doing exactly what you need to do, which is to educate the consumer about you guys are legit, the legit farming operations that you have in legit factory. One of the things about the cigar industry that's been a little, uh, um, I don't know, make, sure, make sure I word this right, there's a, there's a lot of, of made up stories in the cigar industry. You know, this guy owns a factory and that, he, this guy doesn't own a factory, someone makes the cigars for him. Or this guy grows tobacco, this guy doesn't grow tobacco, he buys it from this guy. He's in a picture where it's misleading the consumer, like he's a farmer when he's not, or acting like he owns a factory when he doesn't. So one of the things that I, that I recommend, like, you know, Agonorsa, listen, it's not easy to be growing 10,000 acres or whatever amount of acreage it is of tobacco in Nicaragua. That's a big deal. And so, you know, what I'm seeing is that that story needs to get to the consumers. And the beauty of this is that we're living in a time where people can get that story through social media, through videos, through, you know, engaging with the customers on that. So uh, I, I think you guys are doing exactly what you need to do. But um, back to your question on the lounge part, um, that's, that's, that's a tougher thing. Because at the end of the day, when you're looking at like a Casa Fuente or a, you know, Monte Cristo or Davidoff, these brands are internationally known. And you know, Drew Estate is, is a big company as well that's, that's got, you know, it's, it's well known. So I think that everybody just needs to find their niche, whatever it is. And in your case, for Agonorsa, the niche, it, what, what's incredible is nobody can, it ain't easy to just become this giant tobacco grower that grows great tobacco in Central America. The, the, you know, there's very, the, the costs that are involved in doing that and setting that up. I mean, how many of your competitors can do that? So I, I think that that's what you guys are doing right now is, is exactly what needs to be done. Another question? Um, I've been in sales all my life, and your opening comments about how salespeople are an asset who need to be managed. Um, when you hire an employee for your store, the two of you come to an agreement, you sign documents, it, there's a real understanding, there's a code of conduct, there's a job description. Have any of you ever tried to do the same thing with the reps, that when you come into my store, Here's, here's kind of, you know, what I want you to follow, and let's revisit in, in three months and see how you've grown. So that way you're educating them to your needs and your expectations, and you're giving them a chance to prove that, that they want to rise to that challenge. Yeah, the, the thing is, is that the manufacturers should do that with their own employees. Uh, you have to remember the cigar business is not that sophisticated when you look at other industries. Again, I, mean, I started my career in the automotive industry. Well, who's in the automotive industry? You know, General Motors and Ford and Goodyear and Champion and, and these are big companies. So they knew how to manage marketing, they knew how to manage sales guys. Look at who cigar makers are. Some of these guys were farmers or just cigar rollers that now have a real business. They, they don't necessarily have the skill set that somebody from General Motors had. 
or Ford or whatever or, or, or Budweiser. So that's where, that's where the industry itself, listen, we're a small industry, we're only $1 billion. That's very small. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's part of the one, of one of the things about the industry that's, that's great that it's small, but, you know, it's just not that sophisticated. However, it's getting better. People are figuring it out. We're over our time a little bit. We got one more question. Ah, uh, Mr. Newman. Thank you, Glenn. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, first of all, this has been a really fantastic panel. Uh, ben, wherever you are, I hope you're recording this because we'd love to get a copy and show our sales team. But maybe this is a good question to end on. Love to hear from our panelists. You guys have deep experience in this industry. Where do you think the premium cigar industry is going? What are the trends that you see? Where, where are we going to be in five years? Why don't we start with Michael on yeah. that, and then we'll do Rick and, yeah. and Jeff to close up. Oh, boy. Well, that depends on regulation and how well Glenn does his job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. But uh, I, I'm really excited about the future, uh, just because uh, for, for the 22 years I've been in the business, the cigars have never been better. Um, yeah. There are so many good cigars now, and, uh, you know, people are creating new farms and, and growing great tobacco and blending great cigars and all the younger generations of cigar makers, you know, family that are, are getting involved in business and it's becoming creative. So I, I think there's a huge future and uh, obviously uh, if when Cuba opens, that's going to create more excitement and bring more people in, into the cigar world and interested in trying cigars. And so I, I, I see a great future as long as the government doesn't put us out of business. So yeah. let me hit a follow-up question, though, because Michael's in Las Vegas, and this is a very international town. You know, you see where the people are coming in the casinos. They're from all over the place, right? We're in Orlando. We're, we're more of a, a domestic convention town, people coming from, from within the United States. Do you see a lot of, for example, there's a lot of Asians that are traveling here and things like that. How, how's the international people that are coming in here, do they, are they buying cigars too, or do you see, are you seeing that cigar culture in these other countries kind of ticking up, or? Yeah, yeah to answer your question, yes. Um, uh, it, it, our strip properties, I, I see a big uptick in uh, Asian consumption. So I see, uh, especially with uh, Chinese, mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, where they, a few years ago, were crazy about French wines and things like that. Now they're getting really interested in cigars, and, and especially non-Cuban cigars, right. uh, because uh, you know in China they get a lot of you know Cubans, and they come here and they're amazed by the quality of, of the stuff coming out of you know who we deal with, Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and, and so forth. So I see a lot of in, interest there uh, in, in that market segment. Rick, the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I'm going to agree with these guys. I think the future is good. I think our biggest obstacles is taxation and the government regulation. And I think that so far we've seen from the response from the vendors, et cetera, that they've been able to maneuver with the regulations, et cetera. Um, I think that there's always going to be a market for two of the things that cigars represent, in my opinion, uh, two, just, just two of many things, but one would be luxury. There's always going to be a market for luxury. Yep. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, relaxation. And there's always going to be a market for relaxation. So I think this is a very uh, exciting time. We are going to have to make changes. There's going to be uh, things that we've got to adapt to, like in other uh, markets as well. But I think that for the most part, as long as we, see I think uh, one of the, real quick, one of the big things is we have got to as consumers, as retail stores, as vendors, we need to remember that we need to band together with this. It is so important to be involved in CRA, et cetera. Be involved in your local community um, to help fight some of these regulations that are coming through and the taxation that is coming through as well. And it's. It, a lot of times I feel like we get split up a little bit too much. Well, they've got a store across town, so I don't want to talk with them. That's garbage. 
You're both on the same team and you need to realize that the true enemy out there are the people that are trying to tax you out of business because they want smoking gone, period. And you need to set aside those things. There's plenty of customers, plenty of customers for us all to share. But it's really about getting together as a common force to be reckoned with. Let me, let me touch on it real quick, because Drew Newman asked this question. If folks, you don't know, maybe do or don't, he's a fourth generation cigar person. So one of the interesting things about the cigar industry is that back in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, cigar consumption was going way down. People weren't just, the only people who were smoking cigars were old people. I can tell you that that's no longer the case, that we have a very strong consumer demand that is people that are, whether they're college-aged people, middle-aged, older, whatever, they all like to enjoy cigars. Our, so our issue isn't the, the demand side. Mm -hmm. Our issue is on whether we can supply. And when I say supply, meaning are we still gonna be able to have cigar smoking in cigar shops? Yes. Are you still gonna be able to have a cigar bar? Now these are the challenges, I'm sure Michael's always worried about this as well, that when you have these, when you're in these really expensive properties, and then all of a sudden somebody at City Hall, you know, 10 o'clock at night while you're, you know, going to sleep past some crazy law where you can't have a cigar bar. That's the real threat. So every community that you're in, you need to watch what's going on on that. And it's not that hard to do. Just, just, just make sure you're somehow, some way connected with somebody on that city council or in that county commission because that's where the problems happen without you knowing. The stuff that happens on the state level, you gotta fight it, but you get a heads up. What I've seen happen in Orlando is literally, if it wasn't for a friend of mine calling me up on a Friday night saying she saw something on the news that they're gonna vote on Monday, that I had no idea, that really, that would have made it illegal to smoke in our cigar bars. This is a big deal. You're talking about on Monday, you could be out of business. And that's the way the city councils and county commissions work. They do it stealthy. They get these anti-tobacco, you know, these little freaks or whatever you want to call them, and they just want to control life. And they go and they work the seven or eight or nine county commissioners, and you don't even know it's happening. So just make sure you watch out for that, because that's the biggest danger that 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 for your business. And those people need a they need a, a boogeyman. You know, without a boogeyman, they cease to exist. However, so. I will say this. Your city council guys and your county commission guys are usually, they're not, a, they're not your enemy. There might be one, that's usually how it works, there's one guy. But the other seven are like, dude, come on, we got a gazillion things happening going on. Do we really need to put out, you know, your cigar store out of business or shut down the one little cigar bar in town? At the end of the day, public, the public is not a fan of that. They don't like the idea of the city council or county commission putting the one little, whatever, the, the one little cigar shop out of business. And they, they're not, it, it does not resonate with the general public. Last thing to add to this quickly, and this is something that helped us go from a 95% tax in our state with tax on, 95% tax on shipping and, th and a cap of 350 down to a 50 cent tax. And I hope this helps any of you if you're going through any of that as well. Remember that this is not about tobacco. This is about small business. This is an attack on small businesses across the United States. This is what this is. It's not about tobacco. No matter how bad people are trying to make it that, it's not. It's about your stores, your businesses, your involvement in the communities, et cetera. That's the real issue that's going on. I'm glad we finished on a political note <laughs> because I've got to say that I always peg the most creative piece of legislation of the year and we're at the tail end of over 40 state legislatures going in, in, in out of session right now. The bill of the year is in Hawaii. Yes. A member of the Hawaii legislature has put in a bill so that you have to be 100 years old to purchase tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, just the fact that it was introduced, <laughs> somebody like <laughs> Michael Bloomberg will catch on to it and say that's a part of our international tobacco control agenda. But that was the most, and that they would be a tobacco-free state by 2034. It's just how bad ideas spread. De Blasio will hear that in New York City and go, wow, what a great yeah. idea for us. Uh, so that's the reason you got to keep an eye on that. With that, uh, if we can ever be of assistance to you at Cigar Rights of America on smoking bans, taxes, regulation at the local, state, and federal level, go to cigarrights.org. Don't hesitate to reach out to us. I will end this session 
on a marketing note. Uh, I was thinking about this yesterday when Michael Herklotz was speaking. It was the most, in 15 years of running around in this, it was the most unique marketing moment I've ever had in a cigar shop. 10 years ago was the first time I ever walked into Nat Sherman in New York City. I walked in the front door. They didn't know me from Adam. They didn't have a CRE pen on. They didn't know anything. Guy, the salesman walks up to me and says, sir, do you have the time? He doesn't say welcome to the store. How are you? Welcome to Nat Sherman. He walked up to me and says, sir, do you have the time? And I looked down, I said, it's 3.30. He said, follow me. He takes me to this case. He said, sir, sir, this is the perfect 3.30 cigar. <laughs> and I thought, what, I would have thought anything. I thought it was the greatest line ever. So with that, I want to thank our panel. I hope you've learned something. And uh, thank you for being a part of TPE 2019. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.